pleased to moderate this panel. Brian is an award-winning author, professor, and consultant. He's focused on helping organizational leaders improve their sales perform force performance. Brian uh, enjoys industry collaborations and has conducted lots of research and consulting projects with Fortune 500 companies. He's done data analysis, recommendations, coaching, and training interventions. He's consulted with companies, both domestic and international, across a large number of industries from hospitality to technology to consumer packaged goods, industrial goods and services, B2B space, good to our heart, media advertising, construction and logistics. The real world engagement has helped Ryan be recognized as a noted researcher and insightful speaker, and also enabled the delivery of innovative teaching in the classroom. I am sure your students love your stories. So I'm sure we will too. And Ryan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. You can describe uh, your session and introduce your team. Sounds wonderful. Thank you for that great introduction, Lynn. Um, to everyone here um, at the ISBM and, and SEI meeting, it's really great to have you um, joining us. Uh, like Lynn said, I have a really all-star team that uh, I definitely need to waste no time introducing here today. I'll, I'll introduce them and then I'll, I'll set up a little bit about what our talk is gonna be about today with new roles of the sales manager. Uh, first on my list, Kelly Dostal, senior director uh, over um, kind of a, a dual role for Kelly. So she oversees both the associate inside sales organization and the medium business commercial sales team uh, at their next gen sales academy at Dell. Uh, I guess I gotta get the branding right. It's Dell Technologies. Um, that's a, that was a big deal for them. So in addition to leading and inspiring all their early career talent, Kelly oversees a team, also oversees a team of sellers responsible for selling into medium-sized businesses, generating revenue over $60 million annually. Um, one of the things I also asked for my panel just to try to keep, uh, keep it fun was to tell me something interesting about themselves that most people don't know. Um, really cool fact about Kelly. Kelly uh, was actually a member of a three-time D1 national championship field hockey team while she was at Wake Forest. And I, I looked it up. I think you're also in the Hall of Fame at Wake Forest, Kelly. Is that right? Awesome. It is. It is. Yeah, I was inducted in 2015, which was a tremendous honor and very, very humbling, humbling accolade and recognition. I'm sure you're not competitive at all. So thank you so much for, for joining us uh, today. Second on my list, I've got Julie Ramos, uh, Senior District Sales Manager um, with Eli Lilly. I'm coming out of the, uh, overseeing the Austin District right now. Um, she has quite a distinguished career in sales and sales leadership, beginning um, with some roles at Compaq, but then spanning 19 years uh, across multiple sales leadership positions at Lilly. And interesting fact about Julie, she's lived abroad in uh, Moscow amongst other countries and dabbles a little bit in French and Russian as well still. So if you want to give a challenge on an international uh, fluency test, Julie is your ticket today. So Julie, thank Very you so much bit. for being here. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, uh, Rain Randy Webb um, is joining us today. Randy uh, is Senior Professor of Practice at Stephen Stagner Sales Excellence Institute there at the Bauer College of Business. Uh, Randy has uh, over 28 years of business experience in sales marketing and senior management. Um, more notably, he was uh, handled the roles of vice president of sales at M&M Mars and also was appointed the president and CEO of Uncle Ben's, the food division there at Mars. So great experience and sales leadership coming to the table today. Interesting fact about Randy, Randy uh, is a pioneer in his own right with being the fourth great grandfather of his is Davy Crockett. So as we talk about pioneering sales leadership today, Randy is gonna be leading the charge uh, with yeah. that type of lineage today. Thank you, Randy, for joining yeah, us. Unfortunately, I didn't get any of those genes, Ryan. I get lost in the woods, so. Well, I, 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 have, I beg to differ. I think we'll see what's going on okay. with, the, with the session today. So let me talk a little bit about what's going on. Thank you so much for the panel for joining us today. Lots of great experience um, coming to the table. Um, like our title slide said, our, 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 our focus today is on new roles of the sales manager. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed a lot going um, on in popular press is there's a lot of discussion about what's changing in salesperson roles, right? Technology is changing salesperson roles. How do they go to how to go to market? Um, the way they're going to market, um, the, the way they're having to deal with customers, and what often gets left out of this conversation is how to lead amongst all of these things going on. And, and 
for, and this is not a, a necessarily a new trend of sales management getting left out of the conversation. Traditionally, sales management development has kind of been a little bit of a uh, slow roll compared to what's been invested in salesperson training. So one of our focuses today was to start to prioritize what are some areas sales managers need to really be thinking about to develop their skill set as we come out of this pandemic with a lot of new norms being put into place, right? And so to frame that up today, I'm gonna to do a little bit of um, discussion on the roles of the sales manager. And I'm gonna talk about four key influences that have kind of been bearing down on these roles, all right? Uh, and then I, that will set up kind of our conversation with our expert panel to, to help, help um, guide us today. So to, to kind of ground our discussion today, when we look at sales manager roles, we typically look at it in terms of three buckets, right? They're one, first and foremost, they're a cultivator, right? They're overseeing kind of the whole uh, uh, talent development of their sales team from hiring, development, coaching, training, uh, evaluation, you name it. They are the ones that are starting to cultivate that talent. Second, they're also acting as a guide as they send that talent out into the market, right? So those salespeople going out, searching for the right customers, have trying to have the right conversations and trying to close the right business. And sales managers are there to help them pick and choose and also enable when needed um, to come alongside those sales person, people and be more effective. And then last, but maybe something that gets um, maybe more priority at times over those first two is the director piece of sales management, where they're steering the priorities of their sales team towards what's most important for them to meet objectives. Right? So if new initiative comes down from corporate, the management team, the frontline management team, is the one that's essentially going to be steering where their salespeople need to be going to achieve those objectives. And so as you can imagine, amidst COVID-19, we had lots of discussions about should we be focusing more on acquisitions, should we be focusing more on retention to achieve our objectives. Frontline sales management does a lot of that. Importantly, all three of these pieces move together. Right, you can't really do one and be effective. Um, I even would say cultivating is probably the most important piece of sales management. And that you, once you bring the right people in, that's the materials you've got to to right make make your case with as you're going forward. So you want to have a good emphasis on cultivating a, a strong team. You want to be able to guide them in their customer interactions. You want to be able to direct resources to them, direct them in the right places. Uh, to make your team be successful in meeting objectives. So this sets the stage of what managers are doing, right? Well, what's happened is we've got major trends that are starting to upend and change uh, some of the roles and expectations as, as managers are starting to roll out, right? One, and one you've probably seen a lot is there's a big shift in Salesforce roles and structure, right? We've got a lot of salespeople that were forced to move and do all their business virtually, right? No more face-to-face. -face. And so you've seen a, a big shift in growth in inside sales teams. Um, some of those teams are staying. Uh, some of those teams are moving to a hybrid approach. Uh, so there's been a big shift in how leaders have to oversee these different types of contexts and people they're starting to manage. Also changes in structure, right? We've seen very vast fluctuations in size uh, of the sales force as a result of, of COVID. And so managers are needing to start to um, maybe manage with a smaller team, maybe manage a bigger team. And so size or changes in roles and structure is gonna be playing a big role in what sales leaders need to have on top of their minds. Second, I think this one comes as no surprise, we're having a greater reliance on technology and digital tools, right? Um, for a long time, a lot of organizations were dragging their feet, uh, didn't really wanna adopt a lot of these things, but we all got forced into the fire here over the past year. And now you're seeing um, data being um, used tremendously in terms of predictive analytics, in terms of machine learning to help um, guide their salespeople on who to call on. Uh, you're seeing virtual platforms become much more the norm in meeting with customers. Uh, you're seeing start integrations across different technology tools become much more prevalent um, as, as sellers are going to market. We're going to talk a little bit about what sales leadership's role is on this piece here. The third one, uh, and I think all of you can probably relate to this, we've got customers that are feeling a lot more uncertain uh, amongst the, the economic, um, economic winds that are changing right now. 
Um, what we've seen with a lot of companies that I've talked to is that the number of people and the level of decision maker is moving up um, in a lot of these accounts, um, just because a lot of these accounts are getting a lot more scrutiny, especially if they're coming uh, and thinking about taking on a new, new supplier. So we're going to talk about heightened customer uncertainty. And the last factor I want to talk about for our discussion today is shifts in strategy and process. Um, so with the nature of a lot of companies going and adding a channel, maybe a digital channel, maybe an e-commerce channel, um, there's been some shifts in how sales, how many channels have salespeople have to oversee to support their customer's business. Uh, so I want to set up some conversation with that today. And as I'm going through with the questions that I've got pre-prepared for this panel, I would encourage anybody in the audience today, if you have a question that is relevant to the topic that we're talking about, one of these four uh, trends or a topic that is near and dear to your heart, I would absolutely ask you to write in the chat and I'll do my best to try to integrate some of those questions into the panel if we have time. All right. So with that, I'm going to turn to the panel for our first question. So we're going to steer it back and really talk about that, that big shift in Salesforce roles and structure, right? And, and as we talked about, it's part of the, one of the biggest buckets for sales managers is their ability to lead, right? Cultivating talent and leading, except we've had a lot more salespeople with all these changes in roles and structures. We've got a lot more salespeople having flexible working, right? Working from home, having to do it virtually, having to do hybrid roles. And so one of the questions I posed for the panel was, what's been your approach to leadership as your sales forces roles and activities have changed? And so Julie, uh, I'm going to steer it to you first. You, you have had probably the most dynamism in yours going from a largely field-based and having to shift those a lot. So Julie, what, let's go with you first. What's been your approach to leadership as your sales forces roles and activities have changed? Yeah. So it's interesting. You just use the word structure and um, Salesforce structure and structure is what changed dramatically we went from having a very highly structured environment where um, in our industry, we were highly metric and regulated. Um, everything that could be looked at by the way of metrics and um, given, you know, customer lists, how many times we see them, how often, um, everything was structured for us. And the biggest shift for us in March of last year was really just the structure went away. And so, it caused many of us to have to just pause and really think about one of the, the, the most important aspects of how we would get our teams to be successful in customer engagement in a very short time. It was really looking at people and treating them like they're an adult. Um, I know that's crazy. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of companies do that, and I say that in jest, but we really had to let go of all of these, um, these measures to define success and kind of open the door to high accountability and high trust and ask teams to communicate really quickly, a lot of information and, and try and reinvent the way that we were engaging with our healthcare provider customers. So in essence, we were building the plane as we were flying it, um, as I'm sure many people were across different industries. And so I think the biggest thing for me was all of the guardrails came off, not for how we were regulated, but for how we were engaging. And we had to reinvent the way that we were engaging with customers on the fly because there was no manual for this. I love the idea you're, you're talking about here with trust and accountability. So Kelly, I want to spin over to you. I know you've got a bit of a different context on your side and Dell Technologies, but how does some of that you, you feel like carry over to, to, your, to your organization? And has that changed in the expectations in, your, in the way you lead? Yeah, no, great points by, by Julie. And I think a couple of things uh, that differentiate from Julie and myself, the teams that we lead. I oversee an organization, both with our associates as well as our medium business division, where the majority of the sellers that are, that are in our organization are very early in career. And I'll say that every single person that we hired, uh, not everything, 80, 85% of the people that we hired in the last year were in college during a portion of the pandemic, right? So when we brought these folks on, they're like, this is no different, right? These technologies that we're using, Zoom, having content delivered to us, this is no different than how I spent my senior spring. 
I feel like we internally put a little bit more pressure on ourselves on how do we make these adjustments? How do we adapt to shifting from in-person content delivery, training, engagement with customers, whereas a lot of the sales teams that we were, that we were bringing on to enable, train, and, and have early in their career are like, mm. we don't know any different, right? So kind of a, a bit of a benefit for us um, there. And I, I think what we saw a lot of was what we were doing in person translated incredibly well to delivering content over medias like this, over Zoom, right? And and still being able to replicate some of our, our customer interactions over Zoom as well. So a little bit of a different lens and a different angle. And I think that, you know, to my point earlier, putting pressure more on ourselves internally as you know, we've worked at Dell for over nine years at this point. So this is new to me as much as it's new to, you know, many people that have been in this industry for a long time and making sure that we had everything in order as best as we possibly could. And we found actually you know, fairly surprising across our interns and our full-time hires that they adapted so well that it, it, it almost has felt a little too easy at times to make some of these adjustments. And I'd say that that is a lot in part due to them experiencing uh, some of what they'd experienced coming out of their senior year in college. Picking up on that point, Randy, what do you, what do you feel like you're hearing from the expectations of graduates and their leaders as they're, as they're starting to enter some of these roles? Well, I think a couple of things. I, I think that Kelly's absolutely right. We sort of, um, we were under fire in March of a, a year ago and had this change on a dime using technology that many of us had never used before or sparingly to change the entire curriculum and figure out ways to engage our students. And then I think that's carried over to some of what Julie said in terms of empowerment, we had to let go. We had to, we had to break down some of the structure we normally would have in the classroom. And what we're seeing from some of our partners that with the sales program, we touch about a thousand companies a year. And what we've seen from them is in, in terms of how their leadership changed was this idea as Julie was talking about, which is empowering your people. I think that uh, what people had to figure out was they couldn't be as directive as they were historically because they weren't with them as often and they weren't face to face with them. And I think that in change, I think that changed the leadership model for a lot of managers who were so used to command and control. And all of a sudden they had to let go. And that's not easy for people to make that kind of, that kind of change. And I think it also affected the salespeople from the standpoint that all of a sudden now they're given more freedom and they're gonna have to start thinking more on their own than they maybe had to before. The second big area that we've changed, we've seen in terms of, of leadership is coaching and the way that managers now have to coach virtually versus being with them. Uh, research shows that about 46% of organizations coach on what we call an ad hoc method. In other words, if they're with the salesperson, they see something that they need to improve on, they may or may not coach them on that at that moment in time. And I think what what, th what this caused was managers having to put a more formal approach in place for coaching, where they had to actually start building formal coaching plans for their people. And so that they had to put a little bit of structure back in from a coaching standpoint than they were used to when they were face-to-face -face and working with their salespeople, particularly in the field, or even in an inside sales role, we were right there all together. It's pretty easy to coach people when they're all in one room. It makes it more difficult when all of a sudden you have to do it virtually. So that's what a couple of things that we're seeing. Well, I love that follow up. And Kelly, you mentioned a little bit about training and, and onboarding a little bit. Has you and you're seeming to say there's not a lot of shift. Is that kind of your experience and and what you're seeing there as you as you led into onboarding and training? Sure. Yeah. So you know, kind of dovetailing off of Randy's final point there around. You know, we are an inside sales organization. Of course, we have field sellers as well. But when we bring people in early in career, there's a very well-established training curriculum that we have. So really the first six to 10 weeks of our sellers' time within our organization, it is very structured and they do have planned coaching. We have you know planned coaching plans, if you will, and in time where every single person is getting uh, very direct coaching, very direct feedback. That was happening pre-pandemic and we've replicated that instead of delivering it, sitting in a conference room one-on-one, -on -one, we're delivering it over Zoom one-on-one. -on -one. So a lot of that structure that we already had in place 
we've just taken the physical location of, of where we're sitting and, and delivering the coaching and feedback is different. But I think we're very in a very fortunate position to have so much structure built in. And then as you know, we have certainly seen as um, as sellers tenure grows, to Julie's point earlier, the empowerment piece has been critical. And I think that a lot of us say, hey, I'm, I'm trusting someone who's been out of college for uh, you know, a, a month at this point in time, and I'm trusting them to do all the right things, you know, working from home with the distractions of maybe their friends that don't have a job yet that are living in the same apartment, or maybe they're living with mom and dad that just don't understand that now they're booked from eight to five and no longer, you know, just in classes throughout the day where they can help with some of the household chores that may be going on, whatever the case may be. It's not to tangent too much on some of that, but I, I, I do truly believe that, you know, there's been a huge cultural shift of what people expect in the workplace. And for us, that's been a really tricky thing to mimic and man, mimic uh, while being remote, but don't want to get too far off topic from your original question. No, that's, uh, thank you, Kelly. So, and Julie, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to you here. So you've probably had the most flux in your roles. Um, some of that being field, some of that being maybe now hybrid, um, what does that look like going forward for you? And what do you feel like are the new expectations um, of managers as they think about onboarding and training with this, this new approach? Yeah, so I, I think that for me, I had to learn to be less of an encyclopedia and more of kind of a Wikipedia, if you will, <laughs> and love or hate Wikipedia. Um, the fact is, I've been around, probably dating myself, but I grew up with encyclopedias, right? And as a leader, you needed to be the source of information for people. You needed to be the expert. And when there's not a source of information or a way of doing something, you can no longer be that for someone, right? And I think that's a really positive evolution. I, I don't think that as leaders, we need to take all that on and probably never needed to be an encyclopedia. But what this time period did is it allowed for more crowdsourcing, if you will, right? And, and so Wikipedia is probably not always right. I think there's a lot of controversy around that, but it's okay. It's okay if it's wrong. Somebody can go in and edit it and they can kind of evolve it and get it closer and closer to what the actuality is, right? And, and this idea of kind of evolving ideas over time to get to where we need to be quickly and with agility was really, really important, I think, for us. Um, and we we kind of had people in all different places, you know, in their career. We had some like Kelly that came right out of college. We had some that were 20 years in sales. So leaning on each person for their strengths and being able to kind of pull that out was was really critical. And I think the other thing is sometimes when you are highly metric and everything is kind of handed to you, here's your customer list, here's how many times we want you to see them, here's what we want you to do, here's the attainment, here's the goals, all of that. I think as leaders, sometimes we relax a little bit and we rely on those things to measure performance and where we need to go. And it might free us up a little bit to go think about strategy and where we want to go next, but we didn't have that ability, right? And so using our critical thinking to say, boots on the ground, what does good look like now? Is, is this person where I want them to be? How can I help them be successful? If they're lagging behind in a skill set for some reason, what's the barrier? What's missing? How can I get them where I want them to go? So it, it really has evolved, but in such a positive way that I wish, I don't, I, I don't wish we had the pandemic 10 years ago, but I wished I had these key learnings 10 years ago to be a better leader back then. Absolutely. Well, let's, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here uh, and let's, let's go to our second big influence and probably one that, um, you know, everybody's thought about at least at some point, right? And that's all of these new tools that we may have in our stack. Maybe you don't, um, but a lot, of, a lot of firms were really faced, to, had to confront the need for digitalization, right? Uh, virtual meetings, social selling, potentially um, really starting to get on board with marketing, maybe starting to see how they can be an ally and not, um, uh, you know, uh, somebody that's against them, right? Somebody that can help them. Um, so there's lots of, lots of movement going on here in terms of the tools, technologies that are now at your sales team's fingertips. Um, and so the, the first question I wanted to give to the panel, um, and maybe, maybe Kelly, I'll start on your side. Uh, what what new opportunities and challenges do you see these types of tools creating for managers in your type of organization? 
Uh, I, I think, you know, anytime you're learning a new tool or, or bringing in something new, there's going to be an element of change. And as us humans, we know that with change comes oftentimes resistance and a, a time frame of ability to adapt to that new tool. So there's always going to be a little bit of a lag to be able to, to be uh, efficient with adopting a new tool and to get groups of people to buy into that tool. So I think, you know, there's some challenges that can be there for for leaders and for managers and it's around change management right and i think some leaders have a lot of experience in change management and some don't so i think it's a great learning opportunity for leaders who are growing their skill set and want to engage and, and learn how to you know go through things like change management this is a phenomenal example i think through the pandemic we've had to get comfortable with this fast so many tools have come into play we really had no prep time no warning. It, it went from today you're in the office to tomorrow or at the end of this weekend, we're all working from home. And oh, by the way, we don't have any time to prepare for any of this. All right. For us, we've been asking for hybrid working in the office some days, working from home some days. And, you know, we talked about trust a little bit already. And I think this, this forced us, right? It didn't give us an option to do that. And we've learned a, a ton about, uh, about the capabilities that we have. I think the second thing that I'll mention is around pace and volume, right? I think that tools are phenomenal, but oftentimes tools are brought in for efficiency. And with efficiency, a couple can mean a couple different things. One is an increase in pace. Two is likely going to be an increase in volume, especially when we look at it through a sales lens. So what does that mean for our sellers and for our leaders? There's more volume to manage, right? So um, I think that with that comes potentially increased workload, right? So when we look at the, the workday, if prior to being in this environment, maybe I was talking to three customers a day. Now I'm talking to six. Now I'm talking to nine customers in a day. What does that mean for my follow-up actions that have to happen? What does it mean for all the other resources that are involved in this particular deal to get done? So I think that that's, you know, a potentially certainly a positive, but also it's understanding. And this has been a big theme of the pandemic has been workload and our tools that are meant to make us more efficient, actually driving up the load of work that we have in other areas that we may not initially see, um, we think, great, more deals. This is really wonderful. But am I putting that load onto one person or am I saying, hey, wow, now we need to go out and hire more people? I love that. I love that. And I love the, the idea of change management. I'm just going to stop on that term real fast, change management. I feel like that's a really important one for a lot of managers uh, right now. What, what do you see as some of the key you know, factors for change management to be successful? Um, from a, from a manager standpoint, what are some key milestones or some things to keep in place so that they, they can, they can know things are going in the right direction. And what, what's been your experience with that? I think the key is understanding the why, why are we making this change and what's the value of the change? If we just say to a group of people, we're doing this, we're doing it my way and we already invested in it, go do it. It's tough to get people to buy into that sometimes, right? You're going to have your early adopters that are like, sure, great, I'll do whatever my leader tells me to do. You're going to have that middle of the pack people that's generally going to be higher volume of people that are going to question some of it. And then you're going to have some people that never adopt it, right? So how can I get a mass amount of my people to adopt a change? And I think for, for myself, the leaders that I work with day in and day out, it's making sure that we understand, does your team understand the why? Mm -hmm. What's the purpose behind really everything that we do. And certainly when we look at, at tool changes there, I mentioned earlier, some of the growing pains of, of bringing on a new, a new tool, people just say, well, I just want to go back to how I've always been doing it. All right, it's, it's easier that way. I don't want to go through this process. If we can explain potentially the why and what are some of the outcomes of, of these changes, I think that's probably the thing that pops, pops off the page for me. So I love that you talked a little bit about, because from a, from a, uh, somebody that's in the field, they probably look sometimes at these tools as this is just another thing I have to do, right? Another, mm -hmm. another tool, another thing I've got to learn how to do. Randy, I'm going to turn to you because I feel like you're on the side of students and they may see it more as you're the, all the opportunities of so like, I have how I can be more successful. What's been your uh, experience with adding some of these technologies and some of your curriculum opportunities, challenges for sales management? Well, we, we've been fortunate that we've had a partnership with uh, Salesforce.com for quite a few years. So our students are used to using it. But just like Kelly was talking about, the, the, the idea is to actually get them to enter the data um, because it's only as good as the information you put in it. And the biggest struggle we have, even though they, they 
they're fine with the technology. They know how to use it. We train them on, on how to use the, uh, the entire suite of things available in Salesforce. But at the end of the day, it's getting them to actually enter the information and on a consistent basis. And we think compensation plans work. And so we make it part of their grade that they have to enter that data in order to be able to get the, get the grade that they're after in the course. Um, but it's, um, the change is hard. Even for, for my students, we introduced Zoom Info for the first time. We developed a relationship with Zoom and gave them Zoom Info uh, to use in our key account selling class, for example. And they pretty well adapted to that. They, they were able to, to jump on that. In my sales management class, we introduced a new technology uh, using uh, simulations, sales simulations, where they could actually go in and make presentations, do prospecting, do all these things. And it was based on artificial intelligence and game theory, thinking that they would try to get their score up. And again, just like in Salesforce, the issue was they saw the benefit of it and the why, but the issue was one of time. And did they have the time to be able to really put the information in, put the time in to really make themselves better using the simulation technology. And what we ran into is, and, and Kelly touched on this, as you give them more and more tools, something has to, has to give and in the way of time and what they're doing already. And we have a tendency to, I think, to kind of, these things are additive and we never take anything away. And I think that's a real problem in terms of, we, we, we see it as change management, people dealing with change, that's true. But I also think a big part of that is just giving them the time to be able to say, okay, prioritize. This is, this is, this is the why it's important for you to do these things that we're giving you these tools. And I just think that something's gotta give somewhere along the way with our people when we are adding all of these new technologies. We see them as productivity enhancements they see it as this is one more thing I've got to do. So Julie, I want to steer it over to you as um, you know, I, I, I think we've talked about this a little bit before, you know, you were in a position where a lot of your team had to adopt technology in order for them to continue conducting business. Right. So yeah. talk us through a little bit of that and the opportunities and challenges as a leader that you took on with that. Yeah. So as you can imagine um, for those that know, um, Lily, I'm in pharma. And so our job is really to access healthcare providers and in a very busy day in a COVID environment and kind of pre and post, um, at best, they're, they're crazy busy. Everyone is, of us has been to the doctor. Every one of us knows that we're competing for time with our clinicians. And so as sales professionals, when we walk in, we're on their time. And so we were used to in a live environment conducting short snippets and really getting access most of the time to these clinicians and really quick sound bites. We were brought home and we had to adopt all new technology. I mean, we had our iPads with, um, with core visual aids, you know, on our iPads in the field prior, but now we were trying to get customers, your doctors and nurse practitioners and physician assistants on a virtual platform that they may or may not want to interact with at all. Um, and we don't have the ability to teach them how to do it. So there's a lot of hesitation to that. And, and they talked about the challenges, both Kelly and Randy, and they were so real. And you had this fatigue that kind of sets in because people want to be successful and they can't quite find the path forward. I'll tell you that finding the bright spots early with any change management is such a huge part of it too, right? And those bright spots, when people start, to, especially salespeople, when they start to see someone being successful and they see that they can replicate that, then they're, in, they're on board, they're in it, right? And so what we saw is where we went from a two to three minute call average um, pre-pandemic, we went to a 20 minute interaction with our customers over lunch or after hours because we were able to meet them on their terms finally. We weren't rolling up in their clinic when they were triaging five patients at one time. We could do it after hours or first thing in the morning or you know, really when it worked best for them. So we got a headspace with this customer that we hadn't enjoyed in a long time or hadn't seen since I've been in pharma for 20 years. So I think that was one of the real bright spots for us that we were able to shrink our um, sales cycle from about seven to, to get some sort of change, seven live calls down to two. 
So that shortened our, our sales cycle tremendously with these customers and, and trying to get them to understand and educate and, and make some moves. So it was a really powerful tool. It also enabled in a very highly regu regulated industry, um, our marketing teams, we were so much more lockstep. They were able to deliver so much faster content because it was digital. They didn't have to go to print and all that stuff. So it, I think we became more agile during that time period. We were very outdated, a little bit of a dinosaur as far as industry goes. What do you feel like is going to stay going forward or what will, will something come back? What do you feel like that's going to look like? I hope so. We're in the field now um, again, fully. And I hope that we keep, we, call, we say that we're in a hybrid state, whereas we might have been doing 10 calls a day before, sales calls a day. We're down to about five because access is still very um, sketchy in a live environment, as we would expect, right? Because they're worried about other things. Um, but what I will say is if we can find a way to harness the power of these digital tools and um, reduce, take things off people's plate, as Randy said, and Kelly, so so beautifully pointed out, if we can find a way to focus people in on the bright spots of what both can do together, then we are so much more powerful and we're able to meet the customer where they are um, and based on what their needs are and really reduce our sales cycle time. So that's what I hope. I hope all this stays um, in a way that we're able to, you know, do better for the customer moving forward and their patients. Wonderful. Uh, this is for everyone. Um, we talked a little bit about, you talked a little bit about coaching um, for a second. I think the idea of coaching is probably maybe prevalent in all of these topics today, but I want to stop for a second on this. How do you feel like coaching has changed for leadership as a result of some of these technologies? And anybody can take this one. Kelly, you want to jump in or you want me to take it? I think I, I think Go ahead, Julie. It's, I had probably the biggest change, right, with all this technology. And so I would say we have to be early adopters of technology now, right? And so we had some folks that were coming in out of university setting and um, that were early career, and we were able to leverage their skill sets and their enthusiasm for technology and really bring those bright spots through. But as leaders, it's really important for us to not rest on what we've always done, but continue to be very agile and adopt these things because there are some efficiencies. And as I just discussed, some great um, outcomes from these, these tools. And as we look at things like AI, um, I've heard that through a lot of these presentations, right? It's coming through every industry now and we're using it as well. And really being more focused on how we deliver to the customer, I think is really going to make better use of their time going forward. I think it's piggybacking on that a, a little bit would be, you know, talking a lot about coaching our frontline sellers. And I think a lot of times I, when we think about our, our frontline leaders, oftentimes they want to become more strategic, right? I want to become a more strategic leader. I want to get into mid-level management, whatever the case may be. I think this is a prime example of, of taking that opportunity to, to build your own skill set as a leader, right? As a sales leader, it's like, hey, you know, some of these tools are allowing me to think a little bit more strategically about how I enable my team and how I deliver the message of why we need to adopt X, Y, and Z, whereas maybe you joined a company or an organization where it's like, well, all the tools are already in place, so you're just going to do what we've always done the way that we've always done it. This is a phenomenal opportunity for leaders and, and quite frankly, for sellers to think a little bit more strategically. And, and oh, by the way, your company is giving a lot of autonomy right now to be able to do that and to be able to really differentiate yourself as potentially a thought leader around how you're approaching your business day in and day out. And I think that's sometimes something that people are hungry for, but in sales roles, Julie mentioned earlier, a lot of the, the metrics, the KPIs, all these measurement points that sort of keep people in a little bit of a box where it's like, this is your job. This is what you need to show up and do every single day. And you want to be strategic. Well, you know, Hey, do that. But Oh, by the way, you have to still do all, all these KPIs. I think this gives people an opportunity to, to do that as a bit of a soft benefit to, Know, build their skill set and again like I mentioned differentiate a bit. I, I agree with the comments of both Kelly and Julie. Um, I want to take a little different perspective in that um, research some recent research I looked at said that 47 percent of managers don't coach and the reason they don't coach is because they don't know how. They've never been trained 
So the perspective that I'd like to take is, I think that in this virtual environment and using this technology, now that we know how to use it, I think it gives us an opportunity to do a better job training our managers on how to best coach in this environment. If anything, I think it gives us more opportunity to coach than less opportunity back in the pre-COVID days. Um, so I'd like to see organizations use the technology to actually teach their, their managers how to do a better job of coaching. Because if um, in this day and time, our, 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 the generation that we're currently in, the two generations, the millennials and the Zs, they demand it. Yeah. They don't want a boss. They want to coach and they want to mentor. And so I think that we have an opportunity to use the technology to actually facilitate that in, in a better way than even pre-COVID. And uh, so I'm excited about that opportunity, actually. I absolutely love that comment, Randy, because I, I think you're right. Um, the, the tools have enabled us to have a lot sharper and more pointed feedback, mm -hmm. right? Which Going on ride-alongs, you may not have been able to pick up on all those things. Now you've got tools that can do that for you while you're not even there. Um, and uh, so I think I love that comment, just taking that and really just equipping on the process of coaching and less about what feedback, because mm -hmm. the tools can tell us what feedback to be talking about. Love that. Right. Well, let's, sh let's shift over to talking about our, our, our shaky customers for a second, right? Um, we've had... A lot of a lot of not all industries, but a lot of industries have really had uh, heightened uncertainty with issues ranging from supply chain problems to um, demand, big demand fluctuations. And so in a lot of uh, industries, a lot of sales organizations are really struggling with especially getting new business and getting customers to come out of their uncertainty and, and do business with somebody they've, they've never done before. Um, and so with that in mind and dealing with customer uncertainty, I, I'm going to start with you, Randy, and I'm going to you know, kind of talk a little bit. Of, I want you to talk a little bit about what, are the, what do you see as some of the bigger adjustments managers have to emphasize to maintain or hopefully improve customer trust in this, in this phase we're in? Uh, Ryan's kind of interesting. I, I was talking to one of uh, our former EMBA students, one of my e former EMBA students. And he's now a vice president in a, in a drug distribution organization. And he said that uh, this idea of customer uncertainty, he said he was going in and, and uh, was, his job is to go out and get new business. And we saw in one of the earlier presentations today that most organizations actually pulled, pulled the reins in on going after new business and took care of existing customers. And so he's, he's in a tough spot because he's got, his people have to go out and they're hunters and they get measured on all the new business they bring in. And what he realized was that his people were out there selling the historical way of selling features, benefits, need, doing need analysis, and this is how I can meet your needs. And he, he finally, he said he woke up one day and they weren't being very successful. And he said, the problem was that in this age of customer uncertainty, when everything, there's so much uncertainty out there, that what he needed his people to, to, to go in and sell on was not on their products or you know, the benefits and those kind of things like people historically have done, but to sell change management. Because his job was to get their people to change from what they were currently doing and who they were currently using to buying their products and services and that, that was difficult for people to do. And so he completely changed the model of what his people were doing based on this idea of going out and hunting new customers, not being very successful. And he started teaching his people on change management and to get and to talk people to people about, well, why are they staying with the people they're they're with? How long have they been with them? Why have they stayed with them? Have they ever looked at up opportunities somewhere else? Well, what would cause them to change and having those kind of conversations versus features and benefits, which I found pretty interesting. So that's one way and one, one organization that they completely changed their sales model to what their people were out there pitching to going in and actually trying to understand the customer better and saying, well, what will get this customer to change? So Julie, you're in an industry that clearly trusts 
is a big part of that. Building on on Randy's piece here and really talking about getting getting change to happen. Uh, you know, what what do you see as some of the adjustments you had to make and other leaders who have to make in in your industry? Yeah. Um, so change management is so interesting. The company made a big decision to pull us back very early, and we were one of the first and only to be pulled into a, a work from home status. And it, it confused us a little bit because all of our competitors were out there at the time, and they immediately started pouring into us around empathy and empathy training. And we all think as sales professionals, we have amazing emotional intelligence. It's, I mean, I could ask 10 people and, and 10 sales professionals would tell me they were somewhere between an eight and a 15 on emotional intelligence. But when push comes to shove, empathy is so much bigger than just you know one facet of understanding your customer. And so what Randy's saying resonates with me a lot because we spent so much time just listening and understanding the changes that had occurred for these customers. And we weren't even allowed to promote for months and months. It was strange for us a little bit. And we went in and we just listened to how their worlds had changed so that we could learn how to better fit into that world moving forward. And so we took baby steps and we went one step at a time, but there was a lot of, um, emphasis on empathy and listening and understanding how a healthcare provider was being stretched in a way that they had never felt before. I mean, these people have gone to medical school. They've worked 80 hour weeks, right? But they were seeing things they had never seen in the past. And so we had to step back and reframe instead of just coming at them hot with a product and why they should use it. We really had to understand why they were doing what they were doing and the choices they were making and how we fit into that. So I'm going to shift to you, Kelly. I know you're, in my experience with, with the tech side, there hasn't been maybe quite as much uncertainty or maybe uncertainty looks different um, in your space. Talk a little bit about uh, if you are encountering uncertainty, what's been the emphasis on maintaining or improving trust from your perspective? Sure. I mean, you know, we've talked a lot today about tools and you know, some of the technologies that are involved with the shift that we've seen over the last year. And there's a lot of research out there and a lot of work being done with a lot of companies that, you know, everyone says that they want to modernize, they want to automate, they want to transform what they're doing day in and day out. And to do those three things, it takes technology. And I think what the, the pandemic has really done is it's forced companies hands a bit to make that decision. We always hear like, oh, that's in my five-year roadmap or my seven-year roadmap or my 10-year roadmap to make some of these changes. And, and, you know, what we've seen now is so many companies are like, wow, I wish that we prioritized that a little bit sooner. And I'm sure there are tons of industries out there that are thinking this, <laughs> thinking the same. We could have never pred predicted this would be the, the experience that we would have had over the last year. So what we've really seen is of being a technology company, as we all shift into this work from home motion, the amount of individual technology required to do that, right? So our, our laptop business flourished and our storage business went by the wayside. And we honestly did a lot of what Julie just talked about was around empathy, listening, being consultative with, with what customers' needs were at that given point in time. I oversee a team. We focus on the data center. A lot of people know Dell, Dell Technologies as a laptop company. I've never sold a laptop in my life. Can't really tell you a whole ton about our, our laptop portfolio, but worked with my teams. If a customer has 10,000 laptops that they need, we're going to be the ones that are going to help get them there. Whereas historically we haven't. So we shifted, you know, from, from in that regard a little bit. And I think we're rebounding tremendously because of some of the relationships, the trust that we were able to build with customers during one of the darkest periods that maybe their their job or their their entire company has ever gone through. And I think people don't forget those things, right? right. Where it's like, you're not calling me because you want to sell me something. You're not calling me because you want something from me. You're calling me because you care or you're showing that you care and, and that you're you know mm -hmm. having a little bit of empathy and you're going to help me with whatever we may need. And I think that goes a long way, um, you know, for sure. So I think those are some of you know what what we had seen with our teams was just shifting a little bit of the talk track and, and found that that went a long way. And now, like I said, we're seeing some of the benefits of that where people are like a genuine company, genuine people work there. And, and at the end of the day, that, that's gone a, an incredibly long way. I think another thing in, in regards to trust, Ryan, is I think it's forcing us, I think it's 
we're seeing all organizations to be more transparent. And as Kelly said, more authentic, more real, being doing a better job listening and being more empathetic. And many that's the mistake that a lot of salespeople make is that they go in and they're so busy trying to sell their product or their service, they don't take the time to understand the customer. And I think if anything, this has forced us to do a better job of really trying to understand our customer, really what they're going through, how we can serve them better, and whether or not that's, and, and that really adds value to the relationship. One of the things we teach in our sales program is people do business with people they know, like, and trust in that order. And the way to build that trust relationship is, is to listen and to be empathetic. And uh, Dale Carnegie said that uh, if you talk 20% uh, of the time and listen 80% of the time, you'll be known as a great conversationalist. <laughs> and uh, I think that's good for all of us in, in sales to remember. And I think that's an important part of, of leading people to trust you. So I love all the points and I, I recognize that many of us have, have made this shift and, and I know we do in our, in our program, we talk a lot about trust. You've done that with your organization. So mm -hmm. I, I think we know what's coming though, is that there may be a point that strategic objectives start pointing towards growing again and maybe growing very aggressively. So, so Julie, I'm going to come back to you. You made this big shift. Really the message was less on promotion, more on empathy what what do you feel like is is needed for sales managers to maintain this this trust emphasis even when we have really aggressive sales goals coming up so kelly said this earlier helping people know their why right and and i love simon sinek so i'm just you know knowing the why knowing the mission that that your sales teams are are there for why do they wake up every day and for us it's easy. We're there for patients. We're there for clinicians. Um, we, we are able to connect to our mission. So while the, sales, the rebound on sales goals is real, um, we are feeling it this year. They gave us some grace last year and they were wonderful, but this year it, it's real. And so regrounding people in their why and their mission is so critical because the second they start to feel the pressure to just grind it out and go back to features and benefits and shoving things down people's throats, we lose all the good things that Randy and Kelly just talked about. We lose that ability to listen and understand the customer and um, do what's right, you know? And at the end of the day, we all win if the customer wins and, and if we do the right thing in our jobs day in and day out. So we just connect back to our patients that we serve through our customer and um, try and keep them moving forward towards their best attainment possible. All right. So I'm gonna connect our last question here with your, with your comment, Julie. So you're, you're talking a lot about keeping the emphasis on trust. Um, you're talking a lot about customer focused outcomes, right? Like being very focused on what the customer believes is important. So for, for, for many, that may mean that the sales strategy or the process has, has changed in some ways, which, which I think potentially means we need to evaluate salespeople differently. Um, so that's kind of the question I'm gonna pose for the panel here as a whole. We've really talked about a lot of shifts, maybe shifts in emphasis with our customers, shifts in technology, shifts in coaching, how is all this all comes about where we're usually we're evaluating salespeople just on their on their bottom line numbers, but I want to kind of maybe change the conversation and say, what do you feel like has changed about how sales managers should approach evaluating salespeople? Not let anybody lead off. I can jump in. Um, so I, this isn't necessarily a shift for us, but we're I think we're unique in our industry and in a lot of industries in that our sales professionals aren't just sales professionals. We expect as part of their evaluation for them to lead, develop and grow others in the community, in, in our company. And so there's a lot of mentoring, there's a lot of leadership activity goes on that enables us to fill their cup and develop them in different ways, but it also empowers us to be able to look at such a bigger picture outside of just, did you hit this aggressive sales goal? Um, and so people can contribute to the organization in so many ways. We know that sales variables 
can go up and down and things change and um, sales goals change, but people can contribute and help others win um, through their, their development processes. And so we evaluate our sales professionals very broadly and have, have had done that for years. So um, I think it's important to do that. I think in the absence of being able to have all of the perfect metrics and the perfect roadmap for what great looks like, I think how people engage with one another, how they help the organization innovate and learn how to be successful in a hybrid environment should be a major part of a salesperson's evaluation. I certainly agree with a lot of those points. And, and one quick thing for me would be a lot of organizations lead with, we're a people first organization. We're a people first organization. And what does that really mean? And I, I think that, a you know, saying that and then your evaluation is like well you missed your quota this month or you missed your target this second half of the year or whatever the case may be with how organizations make goal people and it's thinking is there a people element are you a part of a, an employee resource group do you mentor anyone what have you done to shape the culture here do you volunteer do you take advantage of all of these things that our company has built to say we have one of the strongest cultures across the globe, what are you doing to get yourself involved, right? And making sure that you as a leader are enabling and empowering people to participate in those things. And then, oh, by the way, do you have that as a part of maybe an MBO or a measure, measurement point or an evaluation for them on a quarterly or an annual basis? So it's built in of, hey, this is something that is really important aside from just are we hitting a number and are you making revenue targets for the company? I think that that you know, there have been a lot of articles that have come out more so recently around the amount of attrition that we've seen. And I'm sure that could open up and maybe some of the stuff's already been talked about, it, but I'm sure the attrition conversation could be one to bring people through the beer, uh, the beer tasting next and into beer tastings for many, many days. But um, it's people want to be valued and they want to feel like they are doing something that's impacting change and that's, you know, bringing positivity to their own life. And I think that how we evaluate people can truly impact um, how people feel valued at a company and, and all those sort of things. So opening up probably some additional uh, talking points there, but I think that for myself, you know, when I evaluate and talk to people about how they're performing, yes, of course, there's the KPIs, but also what are some of those soft things that we can bring, can be bringing up that we're reinforcing as leaders. And I think that those things go a long way. I've had people tell me you're the first manager I've ever had that's asked me, how's your family doing? I know your dad had, had COVID. How's he feeling? But like, I've never had anyone ask me when I've shared something like that. I've never had anyone follow up or ask me those questions. They're like, this is unbelievable. You know, these are things, these are things that make me believe that I'm in the right spot. Yeah, I, I think for people to follow you as a leader, as a manager, I think they got to know you care about them first. Mm -hmm. uh, Herb Kelleher, uh, the founder of Southwest Airlines, has a, has a wonderful quote. He said that, he used, to, he used to run his airline based on the fact, he said, if I take care of my people, they'll take care of my customers and my customers will take care of my bottom line. And I think, uh, I think many times as managers or people in leadership positions, especially in sales, the easy thing to do is to evaluate people just on their numbers because it's, it's pretty straightforward. Did you make quota? Didn't you make quota? Are you ahead a year ago, aren't you? I think that's a huge mistake for managers because I don't think you coach around the numbers. I think you coach around the activities that drive the numbers. By the time you see the number is too late, you can't change that number. It is what it is. But you can change the activities that drive that number. And I think if we evaluate our salespeople more on those activities that drive the number, then the, what, the number will be whatever the number it is. And if we do that well, the number will take care of itself. So I, I agree with everything that Kelly and Julie said in terms of when, when back in my business career, when we talked about people for promotion, rarely did we talk about, did they make their quotas or how much did they sell over a year ago? Those type of things. You know what we talked about? Their interpersonal skills. How do they relate to other people? Is this someone that other, somebody else would want to follow? Uh, are they empathetic? Are they good listeners? Do they really want to make a difference? Those were the things that we tried to evaluate people that to get promoted 
not just the, the sales number. Uh, that was sort of like the, 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 the table stakes to get in the game. You had to have, be successful at sales to be considered. But that was not what got you promoted. What got you promoted is how well you work with everyone else. And I think that's, that's as important as the number. I can't agree more. Great, great insights from all of you. Uh, I see that we're getting pretty close to time. So uh, if you have additional questions for the panel members, I know they'd be ha more than happy for you to reach out to them. Uh, but I wanted to spend this last minute we have here just to just sum up a few of the themes um, that I'm hearing from, from, the, from the panel, just so we have uh, some really key takeaways today. Something I'm hearing a lot today, uh, just in terms of leadership, is really leaning more in, a, in an approach of empowering uh, salespeople rather than a directive uh, style, um, which is going to take a lot more trust and accountability from leadership. Uh, and a lot, a lot less ad hoc, right, types of uh, leading um, um, tactics when you don't have them right there in front of you all the time. So it's going to take a little more foresight. I've heard change management a lot today. Change management probably been one of the big themes, both on the technology side, getting adoption, understanding the why of technology, understanding can we use the technology? Do we have the capability? And also change management in terms of how we should be focusing our conversations with our customers. Um, what are we doing to enable our customers to make a decision rather than just leaving it in a, in a no decision type of space? Uh, and then I just want to highlight this last one. I think this, this idea of broader evaluations is absolutely imperative uh, in the state that we're in now. Um, having evaluations that include um, helping, uh, helping your peers, um, being a good citizen, um, somebody that has good interpersonal skills, does a lot of the you could even call them intra-firm, right? If there's things inside the organization should be maybe a part of the evaluations going forward. So I just want to give a big thank you again to the panel. Um, great, great insights today. Um, thank you again for letting me moderate the session. Lynn, I'm going to maybe kick it back to you, see if you have any parting words before I keep everybody from any more beers. <laughs> Yeah, uh, great. We uh, we we're, we're, uh, we're going to make sure that Christy's with us before we send everybody else off. Um, I do want to um, offer if anybody wanted to uh, type a question or um, just open their mic and ask any questions of the panel. Uh, just give them a minute there. Okay, but um, if you join us uh, right after this, there there uh, there will be people all around. So. We're moving into something we've never done before. Uh, first, I want to thank everybody that's presented today. The panel, I really, I really enjoyed um, listening to you guys talk about managing um, and the care that you bring uh, as a person who didn't, who learned a lot of her manager skills by the negative examples that she saw. It was just, um, I, I almost want to go back and work for one of you, please. Um, that would be great. <laughs> so thank you so much for that, and it's inspiring. Um, so we're going to go off to this new thing, which means you can hang with us if you even if you didn't uh, get a chance to order the beer.